Come alive this morning Stay alive all day Most dramatic discoveries in our universe have been made over the past several years through sophisticated scientific technology. Just think about the spacewalks or underwater exploration, for example. But there's one area of the universe that's still very much up in the air, at least scientifically, and that's the mysterious world of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. What are the facts behind UFOs? Today, in the first of a two-part series, we take a look at the background of UFOs in Alberta and throughout the world. Our universe is more than 20,000 million light years in diameter. It is composed of approximately 1,000 million galaxies. Each galaxy contains a hundred thousand million stars. The Milky Way is one such galaxy. It measures about 100,000 light years across. It is our home. The Sun is an insignificant star in the Milky Way. 33,000 light years from its center. The Sun is one of many stars which are believed to have planetary systems. Scientists have estimated that one billion planets in our galaxy alone might be capable of supporting life. Only one planet in the whole universe is actually known to support intelligent life, the planet Earth. A Gallup poll taken in 1974 showed that 53% of Canadian adults who had heard of unidentified flying objects believed that they were real. 12% had personally seen a UFO. This indicates that just over one million adult Canadians have seen an unidentified flying object. John Musgrave has received a Canada Council grant to study the phenomenon. Well, personally, I probably have only heard of uh, maybe five or six hundred uh, first-hand accounts. On the other hand, there are many other investigators in Alberta, Canada, and the rest of the world who have gotten sighting reports from this area, and they probably would total up to perhaps four or five thousand. On the other hand, uh, if you were to ask me, for instance, how many UFO sightings are there, it would be much, much larger than that, and probably uh, one out of ten Albertans at one time or another has seen a UFO, which would mean uh, here in Alberta maybe 200,000 people. And that's just people who are uh, alive and living here today. We get UFO reports from everywhere in Alberta. We've had them from Tabor, Lloydminster, Edmonton, Calgary, uh, Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. You name the community or area and we get UFO reports from there. These lights were photographed from the highway near Banff. They do not appear to be lens flares or reflections of the sun, as the sky is overcast. Because of the tree between the photographer and the lights, it would be hard to fabricate this photograph. They appear to be real UFOs. What kind of people see unidentified flying objects? The sort of people that make UFO reports are largely and this makes it difficult, are largely people that have never studied the subject before. For some reason or other, UFOs have a perverse way of showing up to people that know very little about them. And this makes it difficult because these people don't always have the details you like to find out about. 
And for another, they have a, a certain sense of shock. I was headed back into Cal for Calgary, uh, coming back to Hobima Reserve, and I looked up in the sky and I saw two red lights coming out of the sky. And I thought, you crazy idiots. I figured there's two planes coming, flying close together. I figured flying that close together at night is just crazy. All of a sudden, they just crossed in front of me in the road, probably half a mile away. Well, I watched them for a few minutes, and they went over about half a mile. Well, I drove up pretty well, well, within half a mile to a mile of them. And I realized that there was nothing I've ever seen like I've ever seen before. It was two huge red lights. They were probably 20 to 30 feet in diameter. I would, I would guess they filled up my whole windshield. I uh, watched them probably for about five or 10 minutes. I crawled out of the truck and everything, because I was tired. I'd been driving for quite a while, and I figured maybe I was just seeing things. But they were there. They are definitely there. They're moving up and down. I got back in the truck, and I turned the truck towards them and turned my... I had uh, very bright lights on for driving at night, and I turned them on, and uh, all of a sudden they just took off. There wasn't a sound. There was nothing. They just took off for the east, and they were gone. I was reading comics in the house, and uh, I heard a, a sound like somebody putting a metal object in a vise and filing on it. It was a sharp, high-pitched sound. And I came to the door, and I touched the door handle, and the door opens very easily. And when I came out, there was this object about 15 feet across and about 4 feet in, width, in depth, and it was just hovering about 3 feet above the well. And it was, it was a dull gray in color, and the light at the bottom was about 2 feet across, and it, it revolved, and it was very bright and it blinded me temporarily as I was going into the house to reach my parents. It was a, a shape of a hat, uh, a, one of those hats that people wear in the desert. It's just like a floppy hat, a little lump on the top with a brim affair. And it just sort of came very slightly to the bottom with the light. It flew uh, northward from the well, and it went through the trees and the trees have never leaved ever since. Dr. Max Edwards is a professor of linguistics at the University of Victoria. He is an internationally known UFO expert. In the mid-1950s, the French acoustics engineer, Aimé Michel, plotted the sightings of UFOs over the French territory for a period of several years. And in this way, he came up with the interesting information that the majority of them lay along a certain line or a certain corridor. And it was later that he projected this corridor all around the globe and then found that there was at least one other complementary corridor, which I have already mentioned. And this is what we call the orthotonic corridors. Of course, sightings take place in other places as well, but this is where the majority of them take place. Let's take one corridor, starting from the Hebrides of Western Scotland. It comes down through the mouth of the Thames, northeastern France, northeast Italy, Kenya, and then down under Australia and up through Queensland. The other one, known as Bayonne Vichy or Bavic for short, let's start at northeastern France. It comes down to southwestern France through Spain and Portugal northeastern Brazil through Chile and then up between the two islands of New Zealand and so on. On the Bavic line they have found these paintings of prehistoric men, paintings of animals and above the animals very often there are beautiful paintings of UFOs. Over 12,000 years ago in France and Spain Paleolithic man painted the world as he saw it. The horses, the bison, and the hunters in these cave paintings are unmistakable. There are other, more puzzling shapes, too. What are these forms which appear at Altamira, Neo, and Les Trois Frères? Are they female symbols, or are they flying saucers? Is this a landed UFO? Wheels of fire and flying chariots in the sky are mentioned in a great many ancient literatures. The Rig Veda of India 
describes the manas or flying machines which were used by the god Indra and other warrior gods. Alien messengers or angels appear throughout the Bible. Other passages have been interpreted as descriptions of flying saucers. The book of Kings relates, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Ezekiel chapter 1 reads, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof, came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. A famous European sighting occurred in Nuremberg, Germany in 1561. Black, red, and bluish colored globes and plates were seen near the sun, along with tubes and blood colored crosses. After an hour's battle, they all fell to earth as if on fire and faded away, producing clouds of steam. A long black spear-shaped object was also seen. In Basel, Switzerland in August 1566, many large black globes were seen in the air, moving with great speed and turning against each other as if fighting. Some of them became red and fiery and afterwards faded and went out. This flying object was observed one evening in December 1742 in London, England, as it moved with a slow, undulating motion. The object was glowing red with bands of black. It had a rounded flame at the front and a long tail of flame behind. The first one that really seems to be a UFO account that I know of is dated 1796, and that's in, uh, in the Maritimes near the Bay of Fundy, where three witnesses alleged that they saw 15 uh, things flying in the sky and, in fact, even claimed that they saw occupants uh, in at least one of those things that were flying in the sky. At the end of the 19th century, before man had mastered the secrets of controlled flight, there were several waves of sightings of a mysterious airship. Reports came from England, America, New Zealand, and Canada. In 1887, a huge elongated glowing red object rose from the ocean near Cape Race, Nova Scotia. A typical account from Vancouver in 1897 stated that a cigar-shaped traveling luminous body at low elevations in the sky continues to be noted at many points on the mainland and Vancouver Island. At times, a bright light appears amidst the luminous figure. No one seems to be able to satisfactorily explain the phenomenon. We were able to gradually see the light through the trees and continued on towards it. There were few sightings reported in the 1920s and 30s, but there were some like this incident in northern Saskatchewan in 1934. Uh, due to muskeg for us to continue across it. So we stopped and watched uh, the uh, glowing vehicle for about 20 minutes to half an hour. It was almost mushroomed in shape at the top and seemed to be rounded at the bottom. There was a stairway coming down from a door, and we saw a number of figures, possibly six to eight, uh, going up and down these stairs. They appeared to be like humanoids or humans, and they came down these stairs frontwards. The object glowed with a lemon orange color and the entire uh, body uh, was just glowing 
yet the light was not a harsh one. As seeing as we could not get any closer, we returned to the vehicle, uh, hoping to be able to approach it from another uh, road. However, we found that we wouldn't have had enough gasoline to approach it from the other direction, so we returned to town that night. We came back about two days later. We waited until it got lighter. Then we went on foot to find the place, and fortunately we were able to locate it again. There were six marks on the ground, about three to three and a half foot square, which appeared to have been pads that must have been supporting this object we had seen. Th these had made an imprint into the ground of about three to four inches in depth. Then in the center of that area, there was a large burnt mark of about three to four feet in diameter. Then around this burnt place, there was a scorch mark extending out several more feet, but not quite reaching the edges of the pads. These pads would have been six to eight feet apart, as I recall. Your mind can play you funny tricks when you're uh, viewing something uh, so unexpected and so impressive as what this was. Certainly, uh, we'd all seen pictures of uh, dirigibles and, and, and such things at that time, but they required a mooring mast. There was nothing here. This was right out in wilderness area. And you must remember that at this time, such a thing as jet propulsion was absolutely unknown. During World War II, pilots in combat were often shadowed by mysterious flying discs, about two to three feet wide, which were nicknamed Foo Fighters, from the German word for fire. After the war, it was discovered that they weren't secret weapons of the other side. And after the war, all hell broke loose in the skies. The phrase flying saucer was coined in 1947 when the first great wave of UFO sightings occurred. These waves, sometimes called flaps, continued throughout the 1950s and up to the present. UFOs were seen all over the world. From the start, governments and armed forces were actively involved in investigating the phenomenon. So, of course, was the CIA. In Canada, Project Magnet was established in 1950 by Wilbert B. Smith, a highly respected scientist at the Department of Transport. Unlike most official UFO researchers, Wilbert Smith publicly stated his belief in the reality of unidentified flying objects. Sensors were developed to detect the electromagnetic force fields of UFOs, and the scientists tried to build an anti-gravitational self-supporting disk. Although official support for the project was abandoned in 1954, Canada made a second attempt to build a flying saucer. The Avro disk was constructed in Malton, Ontario between 1954 and 1959. Unlike the competition from up above, Canada's flying saucer never got more than a few feet off the ground. 
Another committee named Project Second Story was organized by the Defense Research Board. It was composed of scientists and the military. The Condon Committee was established at the University of Colorado in 1966. The Condon Report is really, in a sense, two reports. First, there's a summary which Condon does in conclusions, which say, in essence, UFOs are not worthy of scientific investigation, and we have not found any UFO report uh, which really, when looked at scientifically and rigorously, uh, can be said to be an unknown. fact of the matter is, all they really did is they went through and, and found out what uh, uh, radar propagation is about and what sorts of anomalies are associated with radar propagation, things of this sort. They really didn't look into the UFO phenomena. There's no chapter, for instance, in their final report that looks into UFOs. Now, the Condon Committee report is often quoted by many people as demonstrating that the UFO phenomena is not worthy of scientific investigation. But when you look at the actual reports and the individual reports by the scientists and engineers and others, you find that somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the reports are still unexplained, even after intensive investigation by these scientists. If flying saucers really exist, then where is all the physical evidence? This is a piece of two rocks found on the St. Lawrence Riverbank near Quebec City in June 1960, after a fiery object crashed from the sky. A government analysis stated that the 3,000-pound object was not a meteorite. It was probably slag from a foundry carried on an ice floe. A later analysis of a piece of the same rock by a metallurgist who was given no information on its origin, revealed that its composition was unlike commercial steel and that it had suffered heavy impact. It was suggested it might be part of a Russian or American space capsule, and a guess was made that it might even contain an unknown element. To date, there is still no absolute, certified, tangible evidence of extraterrestrial spacecraft. There are only eyewitness accounts. How have people reacted when you told them about the UFO? They kind of look at you like you're crazy. They make, make a little bit of fun of you, but uh, I don't blame them. I thought the same thing when I heard other people talk about it, but I know what I've seen. What did you see? I saw a UFO.